I'm going to actually get that started right now. Um, so if you would like to have your camera on or off, you're welcome to do so. We just wanted to acknowledge that we will have that recording. Um, if you would like to rename yourself or to include pronouns, please do so. And if you need help with that, you can message me privately and I can assist. As we gather, we honor and acknowledge that the University of Colorado's four campuses on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Apache, Comanche, Kiowa, Lakota, Pueblo, and Shoshone nations. Further, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribal nations historically tied to the lands that compromise what we now call Colorado. Acknowledging that we live in the homelands of indigenous peoples recognizes the original stewards of these lands and their legacies. With this land acknowledgement, we celebrate the many contributions of native peoples and also recognize the sophisticated and intricate knowledge systems indigenous peoples developed in relationship to their lands. All right, is Mimi on? I am. Awesome, Mimi, would you like to do the introduction? I would uh, be very, very happy to. Thank you. Um, so I am absolutely, sorry, I'm having screen problems. Um, I am, uh, I just want to thank folks for the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Derek Briggs, um, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, the book that Derek's uh, going to talk with us about, um, his most recent major academic endeavor, is a fantastic representation of Derek's boundless intellectual curiosity. Um, as an internationally recognized expert in measurement in the social or human sciences, Derek uh, took on an enormous topic, the history of measurement in our field. Um, and it really, for me, represents his comfort uh, with going both broad and deep at the same time and going back to fundamental questions um, about where the field itself comes from um, and how we should think about that. Derek's currently president of the National Council on Measurement and Education. Um, he is a full professor in the School of Education and the backbone of our program in research and evaluation methodology. And he's the faculty director of the Center for Assessment, Design, Research, and Evaluation. Um, and without wanting to take up any more time, I introduce my friend and colleague, Derek Briggs. Thank you so much, Mimi. That, uh, uh, that was a really uh, thoughtful and um, much appreciated introduction uh, that I wasn't actually expecting to give. So uh, what, a, what a great way for me to start this talk. Um, I've been working on this book that's, uh, oh, I don't know. It seems like it's been part of my life for like three to four years. And while I was in the midst and embroiled in writing it, um, there were two things I fantasized about. One of them was being done with it. And the second one was being able to talk about it. Uh, um, writing can be a very solitary experience. And when I was working on this book, I imagined a day uh, when, where I would be in a room surrounded by people uh, where I could talk about what I've been thinking about and writing about for three, four years. And hey, um, some of these fantasies are realized. I did finish the book. I am talking to people. Unfortunately, I'm mostly just staring at the camera that's on my laptop right now. So hopefully eventually I'll get to a point where I can actually be in a room with people, but I've really, uh, delighted that people uh, could make time uh, for this lunch talk that I'm going to give today about my book. Um, I'm going to skip this. I was going to, uh, not knowing that Mimi was going to give this little background about me, so I don't need to tell you as much about my background. I will just say for the IBS community that I'm sort of new to the IBS community. Um, we in the REM program are now sort of a resident, the basement level, and um, I really want to interact a lot more with the IBS community. And one of the reasons I wanted to make, give this talk was to introduce myself and some of the work I've been doing. Now, 
since I became a professor, part of my community has been uh, known as a community that focuses on educational measurement. And the images I'm showing on this screen just show some of the ways that educational measurement is prominent in one of the communities I'm such a big part of, the National Council on Measurement and Education. As Mimi said, I'm currently the president of that organization. And what I'm showing on the screen are some of the central artifacts of that organization. One, this book on the left, Educational Measurement, is sort of considered the Bible of the organization. It's in its fourth edition, and everything you would seem to want to know about educational measurement is contained in that book. I've also published in the journals, Journal of Educational Measurement, Educational Measurement Issues and Practice. In fact, I was the editor of that journal. And for the longest time, you know, when I would write about my bio, and it's still found on the uh, webpage for the University of Colorado, here is how I would describe my research agenda. Uh, essentially, I'd say says, Dr. Briggs's research focuses on advancing methods for the measurement and evaluation of student learning. Now, it's really nice to be able to say that I focus on it. It has such a um, authoritative sound to it. And, you know, there is a real implied scientific authority when one uses the word measurement as being part of the research we do. And, and really the canonical case of where we have measurement that really has sort of reached a, 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 an incredible status a place that's sort of nearby uh, in, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology is actually one of the places that has a responsibility for establishing um, standards and units. And one of the hallmarks of measurement in the physical sciences is the international system of units. And one example of a unit that's been defined with such an incredible amount of precision and actually the calibration of this unit is done at NIST is the second. The second is actually defined as being equal to the duration of, boy, this is a big number, right? Uh, 9,192,631,000,000 uh, periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the fundamental unperturbed ground state of the cesium-133 atom. So, in the physical science, you know, we could. Uh, there's this famous quote uh, by William Thompson, who became Lord Kelvin, and it goes like this: In physical science, the first essential step in the direction of learning any subject is to find principles of numeric reckoning and practical methods for measuring some quality connected with it. And here's the most famous part of this quote: I often say that uh, to you that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely in your thoughts advanced to the state of science, whatever the matter may be. And I, I have to confess that when I was first teaching courses in measurement, I would use part of that quote to sort of talk about the importance of measurement uh, in education. And so one of the motivations for this book is the following, which is that around the time that um, Lord Kelvin gave that quote was about the mid 19th century. And around that time, it was pretty well accepted that the way that we define measurement is according to this classical definition. Measurement is the discovery or estimation of the ratio of a magnitude of a quantity to a unit of the same quantity. However, over time, that classical definition from physics has been broadened to the point that by the mid 20th century, a, more, a, a well accepted definition for measurement became measurement is the assignment of numerals to objects or events according to rules. Now, I just want to point out when you contrast these two definitions, what should be clear to you is that the psychological definition represents a very much a broadening of the definition of measurement, right? Here, we're no longer this focus on there being a particular quantity. The word quantity has been taken out of the definition. The notion of expressing the quantity as a ratio of a magnitude has also been removed. So it would seem that in the broadened definition that all we really need to do measurement is to pick a particular object we wish to measure, find some rule or rules that we use to attach numbers to it, and voila, we have measurement. Now, an objection that has been raised historically for quite some time is known as the quantity objection, which says that measurement really only applies to quantities, and the psychological attributes are not quantitative because they're neither homogenous nor additive. Now, what I wanted to do in this book is I wanted to understand how we got to this place where we have this more broadened definition. But I want to give you some another reason why you should care beyond my kind of intellectual interest in understanding what it is I claim to be doing, say that I'm involved in educational measurement. And that is a great deal of social and behavioral research hinges upon the attempt to understand, predict, and explain variability in human attributes. And the key methods of the quantitative researcher, like regression, 
hello, hello, uh, this is an obvious, quantitative variables. And the implicit assumption, if something can be ordered, it can be modeled mathematically and thereby measured as a value of the continuous variable. This is an implicit assumption that undergirds uh, the work that we do. And have we actually discovered a way to measure psychological attributes the way that physicists measure physical attributes? Well, there is a recent obituary to a giant of educational and psychological measurement, and it would apply that we have. Uh, so this giant I'm referring to is Daryl Bach. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Chicago. And he died September 15th, the age of 93. And there's this beautiful obituary that was written about his contributions. And he really did make some incredible contributions. But what caught my eye is this part where it says, Bach is best known for educational measurement and his many contributions to the statistical theory known as item response theory a name that he introduced and has been unchanged to this day. Bach advanced me measurement in the social, behavior, and educational sciences to the levels of precision and accuracy enjoyed in the physical sciences. So that's my emphasis. And so that's quite an assertion. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, um, but it is actually the idea that I think some people have, which is that we have accomplished measurement in education that is in some ways comparable to the way we measure, measure in the physical sciences. I'd like to give you one other motivation for why it's important to tackle this question. And this is more recent uh, um, in the news kind of example. And that is um, in the spring of 2021, um, a lot of states, um, even against some recommendations that some of us have been given, giving, um, administered their statewide summative assessments. And one of the concerns is how you interpret the results from that uh, summative assessment. And here's a graphic that my friend and colleague Leslie Kang put together, where he was trying to explain how reporting the mean score for students in a state that tested in spring 2021 could be misleading. And what he was trying to do is say, here is the observed scale score on a test, hypothetically, of 427. And that if you adjust for the fact that the students that tested in 2021 are different in nature than the population of students that tested in 2021 and 2019. This value in green is suggesting if the students that tested in 2021 had been like the students that were available to take the test in 2019, this is the score we would have expected for them to observe. And further, if we also take into account that some students uh, were actually missing from the testing profile in 2021, and we adjust for this missing students in 2021, this is the score that we might have expected to observe if the missing students had actually been testing in 2021. Now, the difference between this orange and the, and the green is something that we might estimate as the effect of COVID on student learning. And so what you can see doing some fairly simple subtractions, this implies an effect of 11 units. But a question here is units of what? Is 11 points a big difference, a small difference? Is it practically significant? Well, it would seem that one of the things we would hope that educational measurement could do for us is give us some way to understand magnitudes. But I would argue that this we have a lot of difficulty with. One thing that we might try to do is express this in effect size units. Another thing that people will often try to do is express these sorts of effects in terms of weeks of learning. So this was a report from an organization, Renaissance Learning, where they showed by grade, they similarly had done some um, comparisons of test scores and they had transformed their effects into the number of weeks of learning that students were behind what was expected, uh, what had been predicted of them in the past based on previous performance of previous cohorts. Now, one of the things I wanna point out is this tension and this struggle of trying to understand how to convey magnitude when doing educational measurement is something that people have been grappling with for a long time. And in this talk, I wanna focus on two particular historical figures that had two different answers for how one could go about conveying this sort of a magnitude. So in my book, I focus actually on uh, uh, six figures in particular, and you can see them laid on this timeline here across the span from 1860 to 1960. Um, and the two people that I'm going to be focusing on today, uh, it was actually very hard for me to settle on uh, just a couple people, um, but uh, only so much time to talk about uh, um, uh, four years of work, uh, is that I'm going to focus on Francis Galton and Alfred Binet. And, and what follows, I'm actually reading sections from my book. I very rarely do that. I almost always speak contemporaneously, um, uh, extemporaneously, I should say. Um, but in this occasion, I really chose my words pretty carefully in the book, so I want to give you a sense for those words and how I was thinking about these issues. So let me go ahead and start. Though it may seem that there's little that one can say or write about Francis Galton that has not already been said or written elsewhere, 
I believe that his role in charting a course for measurement in human sciences is, if anything, underappreciated. His fingerprints are seemingly everywhere. And I say that sort of tongue in cheek because Francis Galton had actually the person who invented fingerprints as a method for identification. Now, for someone in the 21st century, hearing of Galton for the first time, an immediate point of contact might be the opening sentence of Galton's biography on the internet encyclopedia, Wikipedia. And in that, re in that entry, it says, Sir Francis Galton, fellow of this Royal Society, was an English Victorian era statistician, progressive, polymath, sociologist, psychologist, anthropologist, eugenicist, tropical explorer, geographer, inventor, meteorologist, protogenesis, and psychometrician. That's a lot. Galton's life story has the makings really of a Hollywood movie, though it might be hard to settle on a genre. Would the story emphasize the adventure, the adventure of his exploration of uncharted territory in Africa between 1850 and 1852? This and other travel became the basis for books Galton wrote on geography and travel and led to honors and membership as part of English, England's Royal Geographic Society. It also established him as an elite member of intellectual high society. Surely a Galton movie would need to have at least some elements of comedy. How else to incorporate tales of Galton's many eccentricities? This was a man who surreptitiously and creepily set about raiding the beauty of the women he encountered in different British cities by poking strategically positioned holes in a piece of paper hidden in his coat pocket. He'd also devise a method to measure the boredom of an audience during a royal lecture by counting the number of fidgets observed per minute. Would the movie show Galton as iconoclast and equal opportunity offender? Because really only Galton would publish in the mid 19th century an empirically driven argument that prayer had no effect on good health or lifespan. One would surely be tempted to pitch the heart of the movie as a story of discovery and a triumph, given the accomplishments to which I've already alluded. It is not an understatement to say that Galton's discoveries revolutionized the way that human data is gathered and analyzed for comparative purposes. To be sure, a Galton theatrical biopic would easily incorporate elements of adventure, comedy, irreverence, and discovery. And yet, it's not at all clear that such a story should be given a happy ending, given Galton's promotion of eugenics as not just a field of study, but as a basis for social policy. Or perhaps the movie would end on a note of irony because for all of his undeniable genius, Dalton, though married, went through his own life childless. An impediment to the study of individual differences was the inability to measure and collect information about both physical and non-physical attributes at scale. And the approach Galton took to what he perceived as this challenge of instrumentation is what I want to focus on for the next 10 minutes or so. Now today, educational measurement is typically associated with the administration of a standardized test, but these obviously did not exist in Galton's time. Probably the closest thing to a standardized exam in the mid 19th century was the mathematics tripos of, at Cambridge University. The name tripos was a legacy of the oral examinations from the Middle Ages that culminated with a ceremony in which questions were posed to a student representative while the questioner was seated on a three-legged stool or tripod. Because these questions required wrangling to answer satisfactorily, the top performers were given the title of wranglers. The lowest scoring performer, who would still earn a math degree with honors as a junior optime, would be given a ceremonial wooden spoon, and that's what's depicted on the image in this slide. Next to it, if you re read really uh, the fine print, is an actual example of some of the questions that were on the tripos during Galton's time. In fact, the date of it is actually a period when Galton was a student at Cambridge University. The mathematics tripos of Galton's era consisted of a total of eight papers over eight days, a first set of three papers, followed by a short break of a few days, and then a second set of five papers. Students could only qualify to write the second set of papers if the performance in the first set met some minimal threshold determined by the examiners. Within both sets of papers, the sequence was intended to become increasingly difficult, culminating in the final problem paper on each set of days, intentionally written by the examiners, who themselves were fa often famous mathematicians, to demonstrate their own quote unquote inventive capacity. In total, the papers took 45 hours to complete. They were considered such a feat of endurance that preparation included not just the study of books and lecture notes, but physical training in the form of daily walks or hikes. Four Cambridge uh, professors proctored the, tri the tripos, two served as examiners and two as moderators, with the moderators of one year becoming the examiners of the next. Um, and the, uh, it was at the discretion of these uh, examiners to assign marks to each student's written responses. And these marks were this, at the sole discretion of the examiners. Now, 
In his first attempt to make a case for the heritability of psychological attributes in his 1869 book, Hereditary Genius, Galton had actually used the tripos as a motivating example, writing that there can hardly be a surer evidence of the enormous difference between the intellectual capacity of men than the prodigious differences in the numbers of marks attained by those who gain mathematical honors at Cambridge. And it's really only thanks to Galton's inquiries that we have some sense for the distribution of tripo scores, because it's usually kept secret, among those who earned honors. And what you're seeing here is a histogram I created for two particular cohorts of students that Galton uh, revealed. These scores ranged from a low of 300 marks to a high of 7,500, 7, with a maximum of total marks not shown on this histogram, a maximum obtainable of 17,000. So this puts the difficulty of the tripos exams in Galton's era in fairly stark relief. The highest scoring student in the two years for which Galton had data earned just 44% of the possible marks. And the point Galton wanted to make here was that if one could find these kinds of individual differences in a subpopulation already self-selected for mathematical ability, the differences in the general population must be even greater. Now, as an aside, because it's so rare to be able to point to the accomplishments of women in an era in which so few educational and professional opportunities were afforded to them, I can't resist taking the opportunity to note something I discovered in my research, that it was during Galton's lifetime that two women, Charlotte Scott and Philippa Fawcett, not only sat for the tripos, but placed eighth and first in 1880 and 1890, respectively. Scott had been the first woman to receive permission to take the tripos, and the results for both Scott and Fawcett were presented publicly, but only after the order of merit had been read for the men. The boisterous occasion, when it became apparent that Fawcett had scored above the male senior wrangler, is documented in a letter by her second cousin. And it goes like this. The gallery was crowded with girls and a few men. The floor was thronged by undergraduates. All the men's names were read first. The senior wrangler was much cheered. At last, the man who had been reading shouted, women, at last he read Philippa's name and announced she was above the senior wrangler. There was great and prolonged cheering. Many of the men turned toward Philippa, who was sitting in the gallery with Miss Clo, and raised their hats. When the examiner went on with the other names, there were cries of, read Miss Fawcett's name again, but no attention was paid to this. I don't think any other women's names were heard, for the men were making such a tremendous noise. Now, Galton regarded the tripos as a fine way to rank individuals in regard to their mathematical ability, but there were two problems. First, from his perspective, it was a highly impractical instrument to be using. Um, it took many, many days. It took the expertise of a you know, renowned mathematician. This was not a practical way to go about trying to do measurement. And it also had no unit of measurement. The marks were not a really well understood unit and they varied from instructor to, uh, from instructor, to instructor. And so he thought the same challenge surely applies to all psychological attributes. How can one overcome it? So the approach that Galton took to overcoming this challenge relied on the so-called law of error which Galton later helped to popularize as the normal distribution. Galton had become familiar with it after reading the work of the Belgian astronomer Adolphe Quetelet, who had also been the first to apply it as a tool for what he called social physics in 1835. Galton came to argue that all human characteristics, both physical and non-physical, followed the normal distribution. His rationale for this came from the assumption that human attributes can be conceptualized as the sum of numerous independent random variables. To demonstrate this, he had, divide, he had uh, create the device that I show on the left of this screen constructed to his specifications, and it was became known as the quincunx. The diagram on the right shows how the contraption worked. A collection of steel balls are dropped into the quincunx. As each one encounters a row of steel pins, there's a 50% chance that it falls to the right or the left each time. And almost by magic, as the balls make their way to the bottom, they take on a telltale bell-shaped distribution within the final compartments. What Galton was demonstrating was essentially the central limit theorem in action. And if the formation of a human attribute was akin to random movements of a ball across the pins of a quincunx, it would also be expected to follow a normal distribution. Now, in my book, I give a number of reasons to be skeptical about this assumption, but for the time being, let's grant it so we could see what it was going to be used to do. And just to give you a sense of like the quincunx in action, I actually bought this thing that's called the Galton board that uh, is not as beautiful as the wood-based wood piece, but is a nice way to show you what this looks like in action. So in slow-mo, you can see the little steel balls falling and hitting the pegs and uh, dispersing. And as they gather at the bottom, you can see them starting to form a normal distribution. Now, 
Galton's method that he proposed is something he called relative measurement, and it proceeded as follows. First, find a procedure that can be used to rank individuals with respect to an attribute of interest. Second, express each rank as a percentile. Third, convert each percentile into a z-score, standard deviation units. Um, this is something that we might be familiar with today when people talk about normalizing a variable. These are the same sorts of steps that one would follow. So in summary, what Galton viewed what he called as his method of intercomparison as a solution to the problem of how to establish a basis for the comparison of individual differences when measurements were produced from procedures that lacked common units. Instead of focusing on the absolute magnitude of a psychological attribute for a given person, one could instead focus on relative deviations of these magnitudes for a given person from the population average. Now, Galton recognized the difference between this relative measurement approach he was proposing and the absolute approach that was known in physics, but he thought that one way to begin bridging the difference was to establish anchor points on this relative scale in a matter that was somewhat analogous to the establishment of fixed points on the thermometric scale. And so I wanna give you an example of Galton's approach in action, which came from his exploratory investigation into the nature of human intelligence. Galton theorized that intelligence might be associated with the ability to reproduce physical images from memory, and that those capable of doing so could create a mental image that had illumination, definition, and color that closely matched the original. Galton created three distinct items associated with a common task in which respondents were asked to create a mental image. The common task and items are shown here. Now, on each of these three items, subjects were asked to introspectively evaluate the quality of the images they had produced from this prompt. And Galton then took these um, record, written responses into the three order categories of low, mediocre, and high. And then with each of these categories, he delineated them further in ranks of ascending order. In a last step, assuming that each of these three aspects, illumination, definition, and coloring, that he had identified as characterizing the quality of a mental image, he, assuming that they followed a normal distribution, he could demonstrate his method of relative measurement could be used to assemble statistical scales for each aspect. And so one of the statistical scales that he produced is this one for the illumination of a mental image. And you can see here what he did. And the, far, uh, the first column shows the uh, ranks converted into z-score units. And then this shows the related percentile. And then next to each percentile is the actual description that characterizes the uh, quality of the illumination at each particular scale point. This was, uh, this was really the very definition of exploratory methods and almost every step along the way was questionable from the assumption of normality to Galton's method of ordering responses and attaching them to percentiles. But as far as I can tell, this seems to be the first historical instance of a scale for a psychological attribute that included ordering qualitative descriptions serving as reference points for a scale. And it's perhaps in this sense that Galton may have believed his approach had some rough parallel to thermometry. And it would take another 40 years before Lewis Thurston would provide a much more systematic elaboration of this idea as a novel basis for psychological scaling. Now, Galton considered relative measurement as the option to take when classical measurement was not possible, but he much preferred approaches that required less subjectivity on the part of the measurer. To this end, he focused on the construction of instruments that could measure physical, motor, and sensory attributes such as visual acuity, judgment of length, and judgment of angle, attributes for which responses could be recorded in units of length and degree. To show that these attributes could be measured at scale, he assembled them into a display at the London International Health Ex Exhibition in 1884. Taken just as a proof of concept that it was possible to collect a sample of anthropometric measurements with great efficiency, Galton's laboratory was a resounding success. Galton estimated it took a pair of visitors between 20 and 30 minutes to pass through all the stations, and the lab processed roughly 90 visitors a day, collecting measurements for a cumulative total of 9,337 individuals. In an era well prior to radio, television, the internet, and smartphones, it seems the novelty of human measurement was, at least for Londoners, an appealing source of entertainment. Now, the second historical figure from my book that I'll briefly discuss today, Alfred Binet, lived across the English Channel from Galton and makes for a fascinating comparison. The two men are both in some ways more similar than one might initially expect. Both were shy and introverted, independently wealthy, and self-educated in the study of individual differences. And though Galton was 35 years older than Binet, they actually died in the same year. But the approach Binet took to the measurement of intelligence could hardly have been more different. Where Galton focused on adults, Binet focused on children. Where Galton looked for intelligence and sensor and motor attributes, Binet looked for them in complex cognitive processes. 
where Galton relied on probability theory to quantify, Binet focused greater attention on qualitative description. And where Galton championed the powerful role of nature in human development, Binet took up the role of nurture. While Galton thought societal improvement required social engineering, Binet again focused on education. The period of Binet's greatest professional success came between 1899 and 1911, when in collaboration with Theodore Simon, a medical student who was working with him at the Sorbonne, he set about the task of creating what became the first widely used test of intelligence. As a bit of context, universal publication had only been established in France as of 1881. Prior to this, children with real or perceived cognitive disabilities were sorted out of schooling. In 1904, the French government appointed a commission to investigate the state of the mentally subnormal in France. Binet gets appointed to this mission, commission and comes to appreciate the need for what he called a psychological method to complement the pre-existing medical and school-based methods that were used to decide which children require special services. What Binet comes to realize in particular is that the existing methods on the table for diagnosing students are fairly idiosyncratic. No one has much idea how quote-unquote normal intellectual development is expected to proceed, so how does one know if a child should be considered abnormal? Although Binet's views on intelligence were constantly changing, two aspects seem most central to him, judgment and adaptation. In this quote, he says, there is intelligent, in intelligence, it seems to us, a fundamental agency, the lack of alteration of which was, uh, has the greatest importance for practical life. That is judgment, otherwise known as good sense, practical sense, initiative, or the faculty of adapting oneself. To judge well, to understand well, to reason well, these are all, these are the essential wellsprings of intelligence. Compared to judgment, the rest of psychology of the intellect seems of little importance. In short, a person of intelligence is one with the ability to, to, according to Binet, to make good judgments while navigating the obstacles of a given environment. To adapt, a person must learn through experience what does and does not constitute good judgment. But just how much and what kind of judgment was needed to be considered sufficiently intelligent was still an open question. The four abilities to which Binet attached the greatest important, importance were, one, comprehension, the ability to understand the nature of the task or question for which a response is required. Two, invention, the ability to plan and to imagine. Three, direction, the ability to maintain a plan in the face of obstacles or distractions. And four, censure, the ability to criticize the quality and coherence of one's response. Virtually all the tests that Binet and Simon went on to create were intended to provide evidence of the degree to which these particular abilities were part of a child's cognitive repertoire. Each individual test was intended to take just a few minutes to complete. Importantly, the tests were intended to require a combination of abilities to complete successfully. None of the tests in his original 1905 version assumed the child could read or write, and they were intended to be insensitive to information or skills that a child would have acquired through instruction, whether at home or in school, so as to distinguish the psychological approach from the school-based examinations. Each test required entirely open-ended responses or a sequence of choices between alternatives to minimize the possibility that a child could guess the correct answer. Finally, and most importantly, each successive test was being designed to be harder to complete successfully than the one that preceded it. Now, through his network of connections, Binet had been able to get access to a small sample of children from working class Parisian households who were attending public schools. So he administered his test to 50 children, evenly split into groups of 10 for the ages of three, five, seven, nine, and 11. The distribution of performance across tests in each group provided a normative baseline for comparison to the performance of any single child of the same age. If the tests had been successfully designed and under the premise that intelligence is in a state of development during the years of primary schooling, Binet reasoned that it should be the case that age and the ease of successfully completing a test should be positively associated. And if so, to establish a measuring scale in temporal units, each test could be located according to the lowest age group likely to pass it. It's unclear just how many tests Binet and Simon had considered for inclusion in their inaugural 1905 procedure, but in the end, the series included 30 unique tests. The first six were designed to elicit the most basic rudiments of motor coordination, social interaction, and comprehension of language. These same six tests remained unchanged through all iterations of the Binet-Simon scale. The next four tests were meant to further distinguish between children with and without the ability to communicate. Most of the remaining tests were ones that Binet placed into one of three groups as tests that required memory, sensory discrimination, and comprehension of language. For the first group of memory tests, the child would be asked to repeat short sequences of numbers or words or to recall shapes and pictures. The second group of sensory tests resembled classic experiments in psychophysics. A child would be asked to compare the lengths of multiple pairs of lines drawn on a piece of paper 
and to compare the weights of cups with the same volume. The third group of comprehension questions became increasingly, increasingly abstract, with the interviewing for interviewer, for example, asking the child, when someone has offended you and asks you to excuse him, what ought you do? Bonet would often vary features of the same test to make it easier or harder to complete. He also distinguished between the features of a more or less sophisticated response. And one of the best examples of the latter was a test Binet and Simon had introduced for the 1908 scale, for which a child was presented with three different paintings, each containing persons in a theme, and asked, what is this? Tell me what you see here. And so what I'm showing in this slide is the first painting used for this test as part of the 1908 scale. It shows these uh, two figures, a, a man and a boy, hauling this cart with a bunch of um, um, uh, uh, materials and supplies in, in it. And Binet and Simon distinguished between three hierarchically ordered categories and responses that children would give. Those that solely involved the recognition and identification of objects within the painting, that was typical for three-year-old children. Those that involved not only recognition and identification of objects, but also a description of a relationship between the objects. This was typical of seven-year-old children. And those that offered an interpretation that went beyond what was directly observable in the painting. This was said to be typical of 12-year-old children in 1908, but he actually modified this to 15-year-old children in his 1911 provision. Hence, this same test could be located at three different ages on the scale as a function of the quality of a child's response. The, the design of tests such as these represents one of the first examples I can find of an empirically derived hypothesis of cognitive development, and it predated the work of Jean Piaget by almost 20 years. The 1908 test also contained famous quote unquote absurdities that would be read to the children to see if they would notice. One of the more famous ones is this one. They found yesterday on the fortifications an unfortunate young girl cut into 18 pieces. They believed she killed herself. What Binet wanted to see is what it so would, a, would a child notice the absurdity in, the, state, in the, the, the sentences that he just read? And he was later amused to find that when this last prompt was translated into English, that American children found it disturbing. In contrast, it prompted laughter from the French. And this just goes to show what should already be clear from the examples I've given you so far, that Binet was making no attempt to devise a test of intelligence that was culture-free. It was actively assumed that the population consisted of children from the same cultural milieu. For all the thought given to the range and depth of intellectual abilities to be represented by his tests, embedded in a cultural context, when one considers its subsequent influence, the most consequential change introduced in the 1908 and 1911 revisions was a method for quantifying a child's intellectual level. The method was best characterized by its simplicity, as in general it involved nothing more than the counting up of tests that had been passed. The procedure for estimating a child's intellectual level was to begin by administering the test located at the child's present chronological chronological age. From there, the interviewer would administer easier or harder tests until an age could be found where the child could pass all the associated tests. Next, the child was given a credit of one-fifth of a year for each additional test at a higher age that had been completed successfully, since there were generally five tests at each age interval. The resulting intellectual level was a number constructed to resemble a unit, time, unit of time, and it could then be compared to a child's chronological age in actual units of time. The difference, usually rounded to the nearest integer, was to be taken as a measure of a child's intellectual retardation or advance. Now, by the time of his 1908 revision, Binet can be, can be said to have invented a measurement procedure, the administration of age-graded tests in a standardized interview setting that could be used to generate a numeric value that was interpretable as a child's general level of intelligence. The results from the tests were expressed on a scale with a unit that had a physical referent, and not just any physical referent, but time, the units for which seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, and years govern the functioning of human societies. That is, whether one was a doctor, a teacher, or a parent, the difference in mental functioning between a five-year-old child and a seven-year-old child took on intuitive meaning in the way the difference between, say, 40% and 60% of test questions answered correctly did not. So a difference in 20% of test questions answered correctly doesn't do much to stir the imagination or prompt a call of action, but a difference in two years seems like something that they can get people to get their heads around. But was the sense of magnitude suggested by these temporal units real or just an illusion? And here's what Binet had to say about this, that really this question is, was he actually doing measurement? He said, well, the scale properly speaking does not permit the measure of the intelligence because intellectual qualities are not superposable and therefore cannot be measured as, a lin as linear surfaces are me measured but are on the contrary a classification, a hierarchy among diverse intelligence. 
And similarly, in his book, Modern Ideas About Children, Binet would caution that he was not using the word measurement in a mathematical sense. It does not indicate the number of times a quantity is contained in another. Binet was acknowledging that intelligence was not additive in the same sense as canonical physical attributes like length or weight are additive. Instead, Binet's intellectual levels comprised at best an order, but the unit could not be given a consistent interpretation when comparing differences along the scale. Difference in intellectual levels between five and six was not intended to be commensurate to a difference in intellectual levels between nine and 10. Still, for all his cautions that what he was doing was not measurement in a classical sense, Binet was nevertheless convinced that there were real distinctions being made between children who could and could not pass certain collections of tests. And locating these results relative to the integer demands of age was the diagnosis of a mental disability better than many of the likely alternatives, such as the diagnosis of abnormality in a child's physical appearance or a child's performance on a school-based exam? To the extent that a central purpose of measurement is the reduction of uncertainty about an attribute relative to alternative hypotheses, Binet clearly believed that this was something he was accomplishing. For example, in presenting the 1908 revision of the scale, Binet shared the case of an 11-year-old child who had been denied access to a public school. Binet had been able to show through the application of his measuring scale that the child's intellectual level was only one year behind the norm for 11-year-olds, a finding that was in stark contrast to evidence from the school-based examination she had taken. Binet's method suggested that the child could catch up if provided with the right intervention. Although Binet did not argue that his measuring scale was a replacement for the judgments of teachers gathered over a much longer period of time, by 1911, the evidence from several studies made clear to him that the basis for such judgments were frequently haphazard and that a teacher's diagnosis of an, indi of an individual child could easily be biased by any number of curricular and extracurricular factors. If faced with the need to make a yes or no decision as to whether a child required specialized services, Binet felt justified in describing his approach as a measurement procedure. Now, as a measure, the classification into, into an intellectual level that resulted from the application of the Binet assignment scale was intended to be a convenient starting point, as Binet was always most attuned to the qualitative insights that lay beneath the intellectual level designation. Instead of means, standard deviations, and correlation coefficients, Binet would frequently produce multi-page descriptive profiles based not just on a child's unique pattern of responses, but on observations jotted down during the course of the interview. All of this was intended to provide the nuance necessary in contextualizing the comparison between a child's intellectual level as compared to chronological age. And here you can see this quote, which really captures the, the way that Binet was so emphatic that any quantification would be worthless without an accompanying qualitative interpretation. When he says that really what we're doing here is not creating an automatic weighing machine, um, that the results here have no value if they're deprived of all comment, they need to be interpreted. Following the last revision of the scale in 1911, Binet provided an important caution. He wrote, these calculations permit the assessment of the intellectual level with fractions, but they do not merit any absolute confidence, for they certainly vary from one examination to the other. However, this was really one area where Binet had sort of fallen a bit short in his work at, at the time of, uh, uh, of the 1911 revision, for he had yet to make a formal attempt to quantify uncertainty due to what we would today generally think of as concerns about reliability. And this was an issue one of his contemporary Charles Spear, contemporaries, Charles Spearman, had just brought to light. But this is a subject for a different chapter of my book that I don't have time to delve into today. In all, Binet's rationale for describing this procedure as an application of, measuring, of a measuring skill was filled with interesting contradictions. On the one hand, he was well aware that his procedure only produced a rough classification, a classification with respect to many different abilities that collectively defined intelligence. On the other hand, it's pretty fascinating that the main connection he sought to maintain with classical measurement was the development of a common scale with a recognized reference unit. Francis Galton had invented relative measurement in standard deviation units. In terms of practical influence, Binet outdid him with his temporal units. Though the Binet Simon scale did solve one problem as a replacement or, or complement to some of the more idiosyncratic methods that have been used to diagnose children uh, and adults with mild to moderate intellectual disabilities, it created new ones with consequences that Binet might not have anticipated. For all his warnings as to the danger of quantification without qualitative interpretation, this was a bit like handing a two-year-old child a lit match and then expressing shock when the child grabs at the flame. What attracted the attention of those who took up the Binet-Simon scale, and it was taken up with great enthusiasm in many different countries, was the apparent ease of quantification. 
It was called a measuring scale of intelligence after all, and it produced a measure in units of time that sure looked a lot like the kinds of measures that Galton and Pearson and Ewell were using for correlational research. Why restrict its use to diagnostic classification? Why not also use it to compare, sort, and evaluate the magnitude of differences between groups of individuals? This was not, in fact, outside the bounds of what Binet himself had described for an eventual use of his scale. So for all the way that Binet's work represented a break from Galton, he nonetheless shared the same conviction that the concept of measurement could be applied to the context of psychological attributes. And much like Edward Thorndike, Binet held the conviction that education could and should be improved through the application of measurement and experimentation. In this sense, it probably places Binet on far too lofty a pedestal to regard him as a hapless bystander to misguided applications and extensions of his approach by Henry Goddard and Lewis Terman. The moment that Binet decided to express intelligence on a scale marked off in age units, it was inevitable that the numbers would take on a life of their own and that, if not given careful attention, questions about the theoretical status of the underlying attribute the properties of the scale could get lost in the shuffle. Binet was already on somewhat slippery slope at the time of his death, having created a procedure for a partial classification but referring to it as if it were measurement. Had he lived another 20 years, would Binet have denounced the mental testing movement of the 1920s or helped to shape it for the better? Would he have focused greater attention on the properties of his age units or moved on to other pursuits? And if Binet had been transported into the 20th century, what would he have made of the tendency of modern educational researchers to express and compare differences in test score performance in terms? of weeks of learning. Okay, so that ends my reading portion and I'm realizing we're already sort of a little bit over time. So I'm only gonna, I'm gonna cut short um, some of the other slides, but I just wanna conclude with this really important takeaway is something essentially I didn't have to write in my book, but I wanna sort of step out of it, the book that I wrote and say something that I think I've come to appreciate having written the chapters that I've written. That in my view, what I see across the different chapters of the book is that what all these different figures were doing when they were trying to apply the concept of measurement to measuring psychological aspects, it had to in some way try to invoke these four critical aspects of measurement. And I have them here in this kind of pseudo Venn diagram. And the four critical aspects that I think are so critical are first, theory, the generation or refinement of theory to define the attribute of measurement and describe how this attribute is instantiated in the object. Of the second one is instrumentation. The development of instrumentation that has been purposely designed to be maximally sensitive to variation in the attribute of measurement across objects and or time and minimally sensitive to other attributes of the measurement context and that produces numeric values that reflect this variation. This variation. For scales and units, this is the development of standards to ensure that the results of measurement and numeric values will have an interpretation that is substantively meaningful, trustworthy, and invariant within specified limits to the objects being measured and the instruments used to produce the numeric values and the person who's using the values. And lastly, mathematical modeling, the application of formal operations or models to these numeric values to ensure there's a correspondence between the values and the attribute of measurement and or the purpose of quantifying the uncertainty of the values. When I take, when I really look at those four aspects, they all interact and they're really very difficult to separate when one is taking on a measurement procedure. And here I've just put into this little table how I see the use of theory, instrumentation, standard scales and units and modeling in both the work of Galton and Binet. And one of the things that has really struck me in looking at this historical work is how the work in this early, this uh, part from the mid 19th century through really the mid 20th century, how much focus there was on really all these aspects. In particular, all of them had some interaction between um, theory, instrumentation and standard scales and units. And this is one aspect where I think in modern times, we may be losing a little bit of sight of the need for the importance of these aspects of measurement to be interacting in the work that we do. So I'm gonna stop there. I have other slide, a few other slides that sort of talk a little bit about what I think the legacy of um, good and bad of Galton and Binet's work, but I thought I'd stop here and give people a chance to uh, weigh in with possible questions. Thank you very much, Derek, uh, for a really great talk, a uh, really great overview of this fascinating history. Um, my apologies for being slightly late. Uh, I'm glad I ma made it to uh, Mimi's very nice introduction as well. Um, do people have questions or, or comments? Okay, we'll, we'll give it a, a, more, a minute to, uh, for people to gather their thoughts. In the meantime, Derek, I have a, a quick 
I guess it's a question. It's it's very. It comes obviously from a from a non specialist. Um, oh, Myron has one. So why don't you ask yours, Myron, and I'll ask mine later. I'm trying to channel uh, Dick Jesser here, Derek, um, and ask um, you to say a little bit more about the role of theory in this history that you're telling, um, and you know, uh, uh, exactly sort of where at this point do clear theoretical perspectives emerge um, and how do they emerge? Well, um, I that, so let me, let me back up a moment. So where, where I think theory is so critical is in particular sort of having some notion of the attribute that is of interest to measure. And sort of an understanding of in what sense you think the attribute is varying and why you think it should vary, right? And so this is an area where I think that in the early work, especially in the domain of intelligence, that you really see some very interesting distinctions in how people thought about theoretically what intelligence is supposed to be. And you can really see in from Galton's original work, where he had a fairly crude notion at this stage, a very exploratory notion of what intelligence was to be, he really didn't have yet a working theory of intelligence. He only had an idea that sort of the, whatever the psychological attributes were, psychological attributes were, that they were something that could be thought of as some combina combination of independently random, independent random variables that contributed to the attribute. So that was really his only working theory for how he was thinking about how measurement should proceed. Binet, in contrast, really had much more of a we think of uh, intelligence as these multifaceted abilities. And so I have to think about how I sample from those abilities. And so my instrumentation has to follow from that. If I think ability is this multifaceted thing, the, uh, thing, then the way that I think about instrumentation is as a sampling from that multifaceted thing. So that's one of the ways you could see how different was, like, you know, from the perspective of Galton, he was thinking of looking for a particular uh, ability that captured the idea of intel uh, 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 an idea of an attribute that could be related to intelligence, one single attribute, Binet thought much more generally. And then came, Spearman came along with a very different theory of intelligence. But their starting point was they were never starting the instrumentation just purely from instrumentation. There was an interaction of types of instruments they were creating that had to relate to the theory of the attribute that they thought they were getting information about. Great, thank you. So this, this relates a little bit to my question, I suppose, in a way that is given that, you know, Binet's, for example, um, uh, kind of conceptualization of, of intelligence or, and you could say the same about, I don't know, ability to, you know, be in college or whatever, you know, for standardized testing for, for that kind of thing. What would you say, or, or, you know, in your book, I'm sure you have some lessons for modern educational measurement, for example, or for modern measurement. Could you say a little bit more about those? Would you recommend um, a, an approach more like Binet's? Do you think that that's the approach it's been taken in, in current testing, or is it more like a Galtonian type of more simple kind of measurement, which I assume it is, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, it's interesting that modern testing, you know, uh, is in some ways a bit of an amalgam between the two, because, you know, um, people moved away from Galton's approach to more sensory motor attributes being th the things of interest and instead focused on um, um, tests or questions that much more resembled the kinds of tests that Binet was thinking about that engaged more cognitive processes of, of students. Um, but the way that these were taken up was very much, much more in sort of Galton's perspective of how can we measure at scale, right? And how can we quantify, how can we compare? Right, and so there was a, certainly the way that it was taken up in the early 20th century. What they lost very much was Binet's um, admonition that this had to be very carefully interpreted, um, and you had to. It was like it, that qu the quantification was a starting point, and you had to dig beneath that to understand sort of the profiles. Like, so I do have this slide. Like, here is one potentially positive legacy of, of Binet, and there's this book. Um, that you know, some colleagues of mine wrote diagnostic measurement, and it really is the premise of diagnostic measurement. And it's, by the way, an open question whether it's reasonable to call this measurement, right? Because it really is classification, and this is something I grapple with in the book. Should we be thinking of classification as being measurement when measurement, more classically, was really about saying something about magnitude? But my point is that with this book. The, the focus of people who do, do diagnostic measurement or cognitive diagnostic models is to say that underneath the total score, 
there's a lot more information. And if you actually look at profiles within that total score, people with the same total score on a test could be quite different in terms of certain skills that they use to get that total score. That seems more keeping with Binet's uh, theory of action. And you do see people sort of interested in taking that approach. The only reason I say potentially positive is I don't have a lot of great existence proofs of people actually doing this very well yet. We have a lot of ways of sort of developing the models, but not a lot of ways of actually going into, say, classroom settings or school settings or educational contexts and bringing to light how the use of this sort of an approach can provide insights that actually lead to instructional benefits. Thank you. Uh, Jean? Could you talk more about uh, the role of modeling and in the development of theory and, and how are you making a distinction between those two concepts? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think modeling is, is in some sense, if you go to like the part of my book that I don't talk that much about, or, or the part of my book where I end, I, I should say is that I end sort of in about 1960. And one could argue that it's sort of in the period from about 1960 really through the, 20, the, the uh, start of the 21st century that we've made the most advances in sort of psychometrics and educational measurement with modeling, right? With thinking about how you can develop statistical models that you cast as a way to um, quantify some particular latent attribute, right? So there are mo there, like modeling endeavors that will take essentially the responses from an instrument an or you know potentially ordered set of responses and from that transform it into something that certainly resembles a quantity um, and perhaps can be given that we've made a lot of advances in how that can be done and how that can be parameterized how that can be considered and in particular i think the idea of saying we need to really if there's one area where there i think there is some agreement about what people in educational measurement are trying to do that is a positive and that's to quantify uncertainty due to whatever we think measurement error is Right. And I think there have been a lot of advances made in how to think about that particular issue. Unfortunately, I think some of that has gotten divorced from theory. That is, we start with the instrument, we have item responses, and then we think, well, given this item responses, how can I now turn this into a quantity? And it's not so clear that that has a strong interaction with the initial theory of the action. Um, and that is where I think we're maybe losing a little bit from some of the work that was done in the early that, that I described in my book, where I think that that really there very much had to be a connection much more to theory uh, and instrumentation. And even though the modeling was a little bit cruder at that time. Thank you. Um, Amanda, did you, did you still want to ask your question? And then we also have Eric's and I think we'll have time for those two questions. And that's about it. No, you're good, Amanda. Hey, Eric. Hi, hi, Derek. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, it seems to me that that we're like at the precipice of uh, you know a new a new new possibilities of measuring um, these previously unmeasurable things. You know, with MR, fMRIs and all sorts of new new techniques, new tools. Do you have any uh, any anything to say about? What you've learned about measurement, how that might guide, you know, the, um, our interpretation of these new tools or the development of these new tools um, for for measuring these psychological attributes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, sort of the last bullet that's on the slide that I've put here is maybe the most important lesson uh, that that I take away, which is that, you know, what you're describing is a great aspiration that you know we have new technology. This is true in educational measurement. It's also true just in psychology. We, we are constantly developing new technology that gives us some way to look at human responses and to try to see if there are patterns in those responses that could allow for conversion into some sort of a quantity, right? In which we could use that quantity to draw distinctions among human beings. And so this is aspirational, right? Um, and I think there's, you know, in the sense that it permits you to engage in a process of discovery that you could maybe learn something about human beings that you didn't learn before. I think that's great. And I think that's the value proposition for measurement. That is, anytime that I'm engaged in some activity where I'm interested in doing measurement, I always learn something that I didn't know before. Um, it is really very much true. However, um, you also have to have an abundance of humility. Which is, and it is, I think we have to appreciate, and this is something I had on, on my last slide, you know, Thorndike's 1918 
credo, uh, which is why I have the subtitle I have for my book, said, whatever exists at all exists in some amount. To know it thoroughly involves knowing its quantity as well as its quality. And, and I just would propose based on my book and, and the, the, right, the work, work that I did, the following amendments, right? There's always something that can be learned in the attempt to measure a human attribute. There's value in the attempt. Some attributes that exist can't be measured very well. Lack of attention to those four critical aspects is one reason. Sometimes measurement can cause more harm than good. <laughs> you know, so the starting point for measurement is qualitative observation, and sometimes that's as far as we should go. So that's what I mean by humility, is that I think especially when it comes to like fMRI and things like that, you know, um, that can guide us and, and potentially give us some information, and it's worth thinking about whether that could support measurement endeavors, but we also have to realize that we could fail and be very humble about the effort and the potential harm that can come from overstepping in, in what we can infer. Thank you very much, Derek. We, we ran out of time, but thank you again for your great talk and for a really textbook case of how to basically use the uh, uh, fi finish saying with you, you know, some of the stuff you had prepared while answering the questions very, very nicely with your presentation. I, that's great as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Um, I believe next week or in two weeks, um, uh, we're next talk. Um, uh, we'll, we'll send an email. My apologies. I don't have it here, but I believe it's the uh, uh, two weeks from today we will meet. Appreciate it. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Mimi.